everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, like Dominique said, my name is Karen Riddle, and I'm in the Department of Journalism. And my research, broadly speaking, is on um, the topic of media violence, whether it's movies, television programs, video games. Essentially, I'm interested in how these things affect both children and adults. Um, I currently, in terms of video games, I have a video game research lab over in Vilas Hall and we've carried out um, experiments testing the effects of playing a violent game versus a non-violent game. I also run a research group called the Video Game Research Group and we have a member of that group right here we meet on Fridays and we're always open to new members so if anybody's interested in doing research on video games we'd love to have you in that group. Right now we're not even really focusing on violence actually. We did one study on mobile gaming and what are some features of mobile games that might make them particularly addictive and hard to stop playing. We did another study, or we're about to do another study, on the social nature of gaming. A lot of people, when they game, they um, broadcast themselves online, like on YouTube or other channels, and then people watch those to try to learn about the games. So we're going to do an experiment where we have people play a game, and they're being watched by a certain amount of people, like a large number of people versus a small number of people, and see how that affects them. And then our big thing right now is VR. So we're getting into the virtual reality research. We want to, a couple faculty in the J School want to build a VR lab. In the meantime, we have a, a grad student who has a VR tech, um, one of the like, head things, and so we're going to do some experiments. Again, not necessarily about violence, but just about how immersive VR is. And I, I want to do it on violence, so if anybody here is interested in doing VR in any way, especially violence, um, please let me know. Um, I also, um, some of my research touches on violence in the news, and uh, most of that research focuses on um, fear reactions. So um, when children see news reports, uh, whether it's a school shooting or even a plane crash or a hurricane, um, kids can often get very frightened. And um, so some of my research has been about how do we calm them down then? How do we reassure kids that they are safe when we live in a world where they aren't necessarily always safe? Um, today I'm going to be talking more about um, issues related to blood and gore, as you may have kind of seen in the title. The last few years I've become particularly interested in how media violence is different when it's bloody and gory versus when it's kind of sanitized and the blood and gore are not there. So one issue is content patterns, and this is kind of in terms of my research focus now where I'm spending most of my time. Has violence on TV and in the movies and video games changed over time? <coughs> Uh, is there more violence in general, and if there is, is it more bloody and gory than it was before? Um, another thing that interests me is are the effects. So what are the effects of watching a show where the violence is bloody and gory, where it's kind of not bloody and gory? And then finally, what do parents think about all this? What do parents care about, right? If we're ultimately trying to help parents make smart decisions about what their children are viewing, we have to convince them that you know, there are some possible negative effects that they have to care enough about to actually do something. And so if we understand better what they think, we might be able to help them protect their kids. Before I get going, though, I want to provide a couple of definitions. Well, what do I mean by violence? So this is the, um, there have been many definitions of violence by different groups of scholars. I tend to draw from the National Television Violence Studies, which I'll talk about in a minute. And they provided this definition for violence. Any overt depiction of a credible threat of physical force. So I just want to clarify that this definition for violence doesn't include like bullying, taunting, any types of aggression that's designed to hurt you emotionally or psychologically is not included here. That's, that's important. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But right now I'm just talking about physical violence. Um, the key part of this uh, definition is intent. So we're only counting, um, it, by this definition, violence is violence when it's a deliberate intent to harm somebody. So if I were like to trip over that and then it would fall on you and then blood would splat all over the place, but it was an accident, it wouldn't be considered violent. Um, an episode of Grey's Anatomy that might have all, you know, a, a, a character, a doctor cutting into a person, there's blood everywhere. That's not violent, right? That's not an intent to harm. You might go to the dentist and you might bleed and you might be in a lot of pain. It's not violent, right? Because that person did not intend to harm you. So the intent, there has to be this intent to physically harm somebody. And then finally, the object of the violence has to be an animate being, like a human, an animal, a supernatural creature like Spider-Man, a ghost, but not like a wall. So if I got really mad and like punched a hole in this wall, by that misdefinition, that would not be violent. It might not be good, but it would not be considered violent. Um, there's, a, there's a scene in the movie Footloose, the original Footloose, where one of the characters takes a baseball bat and starts smashing it into the taillights of his girlfriend's car. So that's not great, right? Maybe you don't want your kids to do that, um, or your, anybody you know to do that. But um, 
that would not be considered violent by this definition. And then the definition also includes unseen violence, but we see the consequences of it. So I call this law and order violence. So the, episode, the average episode of law and order starts with a dead body and you figure out what happened to that person, but you usually don't see the violent act that killed them. Sometimes you do, but usually not, right? So we would still count that dead body as an act of violence as long as you know that it was committed by violence. So what I want to point out here is that nowhere in this definition is there any requirement there be blood or gore, right? Like if you slap, these are both images of people slapping somebody across the face, right? It's not bloody, it's not gory, but it would be violent by this definition. If I were to shove somebody and they just take a stumble back and they recover quickly and they're fine, that would still be considered violent if I had intent to harm them in some way. So that's violence, which I now want to contrast with something different but related, which is the issue of graphicness, right? So I've been interested in how much blood and gore is in violence, and most violent scholars call this graphicness. So graphic violence or graphic scenes are ones that have a lot of blood and gore with them, in them. There are other ways of defining graphicness that I'll get to later, but this is kind of the, the one most commonly used. So in studies that analyze how graphic TV violence is, you usually see a violent scene as having one or four possibilities. You might have a violent scene where there's no graphicness at all. You know, somebody just punches somebody else and then they just walk away and they're fine. No graphicness at all. If there's a blood that would be a mount that would fill a thimble, we consider that as low graphicness. If the amount of blood that happens in a violent scene could fill about a measuring cup, we consider that medium graphicness. And if there's blood in a scene that could fill a bucket or more, which is actually quite common, we're learning in this content analysis we're doing, that's considered high graphicness, right? So everything that's violent is not necessarily graphic, and everything that's graphic is not necessarily violent, right? So you can imagine scenes on Grey's Anatomy where they have buckets full of blood, but it's not violent. So sometimes violence is graphic, sometimes it's not. Does that make sense so far? Okay. All right, so what I'm interested in right now are trends in graphicness. So the television, movies, um, video games, are they getting more graphic over time and more violent? Right? So those two separate issues, are they getting more violent and are they getting more graphic? And there seems to be this sense that people suspect that that's the case, right? Like there are a lot of academics um, that have included in their, in their papers arguments that graphicness is on the rise. Um, but there's really no data to confirm this at all. There are really no studies that have shown any kind of change over time. It's just kind of our general sense, right? And that sense is echoed in the popular press. So these are all articles that were out in, I think around 2013, 2012. The, this was in the wake of Sandy Hook, right? So I imagine this, converse, this conversation tends to get raised a lot when there's a big event like a Sandy Hook or a Parkland, where all these articles are saying, is TV becoming too violent? Is it bloodier than ever? And if you read the articles, there's no real data to accompany this. There's one company, a private company, that, has some, that is cited in some of these articles. Um, it's like a, like a parent television council. It's a Christian group, and they've done their own study, but it hasn't been submitted to peer review. It's not maybe the same scientific standards that the scientific community would expect. So there's real no published data on this. Um, what do we know about how violent TV and movies and video games are? So a content analysis is the type of study that would tell you that. There have been some content analyses of video games. They're pretty rare, um, in part because it's challenging, right? Like, the content of a video game depends in part upon the person <coughs> playing it, right? So I could play Grand Theft Auto for two hours and never encounter violence at all if I wanted to, right? That's a game where I could just drive around and, I don't know, view San Mateo or whatever and never encounter violence. Somebody else might drive around and kill 20 people, right? So it depends on who's playing. So content analysis, what they do is they, they find somebody to play the game who would be like the average player, and then they play, and then they videotape it, and then they code for how violent it is. So some studies have done that. Um, but not a lot, and certainly not looking at like changes over time. There have been a few studies of movies, um, but they are also very rare. There's not a lot of attention to movies in the media effects literature. I think it's just because movies are viewed as less ubiquitous. Like TV plays this big role in our lives, and video games play this big role in our lives. And I think there's a sense that movies don't dominate as much. I think that's why there's been less attention to them. And the few studies that they have, there are really small sample sizes. You know. 100 movies in one year, so it's not like all-encompassing. For television, there have been a lot of studies, like many, many, many studies on how violent TV is. But they, are, they were really popular in the 80s and the 90s, there were a lot of content analysis, and there hasn't been much since. 
And so that's kind of where I've decided to focus my time. I'm interested in all of these. I'm interested in all of these three kind of media and how violence has changed over time. But I've decided to kind of focus on this one right here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this National Television Violence Study, which was a series of studies that was conducted in the mid-90s out of Santa Barbara. Some of the work was done here in Wisconsin. It was done in UT Austin as well. And what it was was a content analysis, the biggest content analysis of television that's ever been done uh, for three TV seasons, the 94, 95, 95, 96, 96, 97. And their major questions were things like how much violence is on television, um, and then if, it's, if there is violence, what does it look like? So the thing that I'm interested in, is it graphic, is it bloody? But they were also interested in other things too, like when, when characters commit violence, is it rewarded, is it celebrated, or is it punished? Um, does it do characters commit violence and it makes it look justified? And these are things that we know from the research are more likely to lead to effects, right? If children are going to imitate, they're more likely to imitate when violence is rewarded and when it seems justified, right? So this study was basically collecting this massive sample of TV shows in the mid-90s and trying to answer these questions. And so when you do a study like this, the first big issue is you have to define violence, right? Like you have to have a, a set of coders that are all working off the same definition. So that's the definition I showed you a few minutes ago. It took them nine months to get to that definition. Nine months of studying every study on media violence to, to make the decision, do we include you know, animals? If a, if a shark attacks somebody, is that intent or is it not? not? What if it's funny? What if it's you know, all these different questions to come up, nine months of work to come up with that definition, those like two sentences I showed you earlier. So the first question is you have to define violence, and then you have to draw your sample, right? You have to figure out what is the sample that I'm going to be drawing from. So I want to tell you a little bit about their sample because I'm working on updating this right now and this issue of sample is kind of a big one. What they did back in the 90s is they did 23 channels. It was a mix of the broadcast networks and then cable. They did most like the basic cable stuff. They included kids stuff. So Cartoon Network I think was actually more kid related back then. Um, Disney and Nick. Um, also the really big broad ones like USA, TNT, and TBS. Oh no, not TBS. And then the... Um, the, uh, the premium ones that are, you know, that tend to show more movies and more things that are, you know, risque, I guess. And so what they did was they had, so this was done in the 90s, and they had this room in Santa Barbara where it was just a series of VHS machines going around, like almost around the clock, like dozens of them just taping and taping. And they still had these rooms where they just have hundreds, not, actually thousands, because they did 3,000 TV shows a year. Of, of VHS tapes where they like all stored all the TV shows that they used to code. Luckily, as we do the study now, I it's so much easier. Like I can get half of them on Netflix, so that's super easy. Uh, but they had this system of VHS uh, VCRs taping for from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. every single night, and then they had coders sit down and watch the shows and code and determine is it violent, is it graphic, is it rewarded, is it justified, stuff like that. Um, what they found back in the 90s was that across their day parts, so from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m., 60% of all TV shows had at least one act of violence in it, that definition of violence that I just mentioned. Um, it remained steady over those, that three-year period. It wasn't going up or down, although prime time did go up during that time, so that means some other day part must have gone down, I don't know what it was, in order for it to even out. Um, in terms of what type of violence, um, most of it was natural means. That would be like punching, kicking, strangling, like using your bare hands to harm somebody. A firearm is the next, um, you know, that's guns. Um, an unconventional weapon would be like if I picked up this chair and like smashed it over somebody's head. That would be something not intended to be a weapon, but you use it as a weapon anyway. Um, conventional, so these are conventional weapons, but not firearms. So like maybe a knife or sword. Um, heavy weaponry would be like tanks and then bombs or bombs. So this is essentially what they found in the mid-90s. And my question is, has this changed, right? Like, if I were to do this, and I am doing this study right now, would this change? Would this number of 60% change? And again, we haven't gotten to the issue of blood and gore. I'll show you that slide in a minute. And then would any of this have changed? Any, like, theories? Anybody want to have a hypothesis? Do you think that this would change? More guns. You think more guns? I think you're right. I agree that I think maybe that's gone up a bit. Anything else on here you guys think may have changed? Do you think the 60% seems right? Right in terms of like what it might be today? Think it's gone up? I think it's lower than nowadays. You think it's lower nowadays? It might be, right? Might be. 
What I think has probably changed is this one. Oh yeah, go ahead. I was oh. going to say like the heavy, heavy weaponry bombs, I feel like but it's not a lot of military yeah. yeah. I think you're exactly right. Yep, I bet we'll see more of this as well as my guess. I think you're right. Um, what I suspect <laughs> has changed. So this is that graphicness. This is a thimble's worth of blood, measuring cup in a bucket, and none. So this is out of that 60%, out of the 60% of shows that were violent, the vast, I mean, overwhelming majority of them were not bloody at all. There was no blood at all. Mm -hmm. So think about the show like that were on in the 90s, like Top Walker, Texas Ranger, right. where they would like punch somebody, and be like, ah, oh, and then shoot somebody, and they just fall. Like, they didn't really show, you know, the kinds of things that I think, oh, I thought I had some yeah. pictures on there, but the types of things you see now, like on Walking Dead or American Horror Story, and Dexter or whatever, um, I think I think this is what will change, right? Like maybe that 60% won't change that much. Maybe it'll go down, but I, I feel like this is going to change a little bit. That you're going to see these go up and that go down. That's kind of my hypothesis. So what we're doing right now, and I say we because I'm doing this in conjunction with uh, somebody at Indiana University. Um, so they did the NTDA study was done in three waves, and we're essentially updating the third one. So their last one was 96, 97. And we're currently drawing a sample of what was aired in 2016, 2017 to do a 20-year um, comparison. Um, and we're kind of doing it in two stages. So Nicole Wilson is the faculty person at um, Indiana who's working on this with me. Um, our stage one we're working on now is apples to apples, which is we're drawing the same sample, the same list of 23, 24 networks, and we're using the same exact definition for violence. And then our next step is to um, do kind of a modern update where we expand the sample to include Netflix and Amazon, and I should have Hulu on here as well, right? Because there's a lot of shows that are unique to here. Some of the, these do show reruns, right? You can see Grey's Anatomy here, Scandal. But there are shows that are unique to these places that are among some of the most watched shows right now. Mm -hmm. Now there, when they did the study in the 90s and they picked those networks, they justified those networks by saying the vast majority of TV viewing goes to those networks. Like on any given night, you know, 70% of the country is watching one of those networks. And that's why they chose those networks. Now that's not the same, right? We can't say that like 70% of the country is watching those networks at night. So we're going to do exactly those networks so we have an apples to apples comparison to say exactly how those networks changed over 20 years. But then we're also going to throw in some stuff that's more representative of what TV viewing is now, which is not dominated by those networks as much anymore, if that makes sense. The other thing we're going to do in stage two is expand the definition to include, um, oops, sorry, to, ex to include um, relational aggression. So this is like mean girl bullying, um, psychological torturing of people. And so I have a couple slides on that. I thought that was next, but I think it's not quite next. Um, instead, what's next is I want to give you just a little snapshot at our sample. It has been so laborious getting to this point. So we're doing the same 24-ish channels. Um, we're doing the same 21 weeks. So their study was a study of 21 weeks in 96, 97, spanning from October to May. It wasn't literally 21 weeks in a row. Like they didn't code for like the week of Christmas because I think they felt like that's not a representative week. It's a lot of Christmas specials. So it's not a continuous 21 weeks, uh, but it's 21 weeks from October to, well, this should say seven, sorry, that should be 2017. And what we are picking consistent with what they did is two programs per channel per week which results in 882 programs. What we did was we were, um, we randomly drew time slots. If, so our study is just gonna be prime time TV. We're not doing 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. We're just gonna do prime time. And they have some publications that just focused on prime time. So we could just compare prime time. Um, if you take prime time television, you can divide it into these half hour slots, right? 7 to 7.30, 7.30 to 8, 8 to 8.30 and so on. So we randomly drew half hour slots 882 times and then we went to the TV guide and looked up, like, what aired. So this we drew Wednesday, October 12th from 9 to 9.30. So we go to TV guide, and it was a TV show called Code Black. And then we had to Google what was the name of the episode. And then this is, like, where it is, right? So some of them, you may not be able to see this, but some of them are on Netflix and some are on Hulu. Some of them are, you know, I'm having to buy them on Amazon. But this is kind of our process right now of 882 shows, trying to track them all down. Some of them are movies, so anything that's orange is a movie. So we drew the Friday, October 14th time slot at 8.30, and what was airing there was Friday the 13th, part seven, so I know I've owned that film and many, many other bad movies. Um, Magic Mike, Adventures in Babysitting, The Blind Side, Mean Girls. I'm actually struck with how much of our sample is movies. I mean, I would say 
like this is just one week, it's at least a third are movies. And so I'm wondering if there's more movies on TV now than there was in the past. And we're not doing sports, so the yellow one, this is the NBA game, so we're not doing sports and we're not doing breaking news. Um, so that is our sample, and then like I said, we're part of our stage two is moving beyond this physical violence to get at what we kind of jokingly call mean girl violence, so or mean girl aggression, right, which is being mean to people and hurting them psychologically. That has different names, there's kind of a terminology uh, issue in this field. Some people call that indirect aggression or social aggression or relational aggression, but it's basically behavior designed to like hurt somebody psychologically. Um, there was a content analysis of Disney films, is one content analysis to look at relational aggression, and this is just an example of what were some of the most common types of indirect aggression in Disney films. So these are like all under the category of social exclusion. So things like dirty looks, gossiping, ignoring somebody, telling them to leave, stuff like that. Another category of indirect aggression is malicious humor, like gestures, I guess, I don't know, giving somebody the finger, making fun of somebody in public, embarrassing them, deceiving them, and so on. So that is going to be part of this second stage here, is to take that same list of 882 shows. We're currently going through that list of 882 shows, watching them find physical violence, and when there is physical violence, asking questions like, is it graphic, is it rewarded? But then next we're going to go back through those same episodes and try to look for like the mean girl bullying stuff. So that's kind of where I'm spending a bulk of my time right now. The other thing that interests me though is, well, why do we care? Why do we care whether violence is graphic or bloody? And one reason we might care is if we suspect it affects people in a different way, right? If it has a unique effect versus violence that's kind of sanitized and bloodless. And so I, um, for the last few years, have grown really interested in this issue of graphicness and how it affects people different from violence that's not graphic. So graphicness, like I said, one way of defining it is what we've been talking about, the amount of blood and gore. But I should note that some people refer to graphicness in terms of whether it's a close-up shot or not. So like, if you imagine a, a gunshot wound and it's a close-up of it, that's much more graphic than if it's like a long shot and you can't really see it, right? So these are kind of two ways that people have talked about graphicness. And I was going through the literature and um, a few years back and realized there are very few studies, very few experiments that manipulate and have two groups, right? One is a high graphic condition and one is a low graphic condition and compare how they differ. There's tons of studies in the media violence literature that's like violence versus no violence. What's the difference between watching a violent show and a non-violent show? But there were almost no studies that actually just looked at high versus low blood. Um, there was one by Barry and Gray, there was one by Weaver and Wilson. One of them is mine, it's a, um, my dissertation, I did a pilot study, it was like a manipulation check on the, the bloody graphicness stuff and then I was able to just get it published. So there's very few studies doing that. There's a couple studies in the video game literature that you can kind of see as doing that. They don't use the word graphicness, but you know in a lot of video games you can turn the blood on or off? There are studies that have looked at what is the difference between having the blood on and off. And even though they don't use the word graphicness, it kind of is that. But as I was reading through this and thinking, okay, if I were to design a study that was to make some predictions, like what, are, what do I theoretically think would happen if somebody sees bloody violence versus not, and I'm looking through the literature and realizing there's no theory out there. And so I just decided, well, I'm going to make, I'm just going to build a theory, I'm going to make it. And so my reading through this literature to try to figure out where to start led me to this entirely different area of research that I decided um, was really similar that I could draw from. And it might be something that even counted in your class as the vividness effects research, which is not about media violence at all. This is out of psychology and persuasion. These are the, the studies that are testing ad, let's say there's an ad that's trying to design to get you to not smoke. And a vivid version would be this really graphic picture of a lung, you know, like that's a smoker's lung that's all black and, and this looks kind of gross versus a less graphic version of that. There are a lot of studies that have done that, that looks at graphic, um, you know, this is a car crash if you text and drive and it's really graphic and gross versus not. So there's this whole literature that's doing that called vividness effects. Mm -hmm. What are the effects of like persuading somebody with really vivid imagery versus not? And so I went to that literature, and the first people that started talking about it were these guys, Nisbet and Ross, and they defined vividness as being three things. Vivid, a vivid stimuli is something that's concrete, meaning like there's a lot of details that are shown. And vivid stimuli are proximate, meaning they're like close to you. So something that's close is vivid, something that's far is not vivid. 
And then vivid stimuli are emotionally interesting. They like show things with strong emotions. So I was reading through this and I kind of felt like this is so closely related to what I'm doing. They're not using the same terms. They're not talking about media violence. They're not talking about graphicness. But this sounds like what, I, what I'm talking about. And so then I went down this kind of vividness rabbit hole and I was you know, Googling all sorts of vivid things and I found an entirely different area of research that also uses the word vividness but has entirely different definition. So people studying virtual reality like Stoyer have been talking about vividness for a long time and their definition has two parts. Two parts that seem like different from those three parts. So they use the word vividness to refer to breath. So like um, radio is a medium that doesn't have a lot of breath because you can only hear it. But video games have side sound motion and you can feel it, right? So a medium with a lot of breath it evokes many senses. And then they also talk about depth. So that's like the quality of the presentation. So like being an HD show versus not, or having many pixels per square inch or something. High quality sound. So I'm looking through this literature, and I'm just kind of going down this vividness rabbit hole, like I said. And it, it occurred to me that if you kind of put this together, you've got this kind of holistic sense of what the word vividness means. And then furthermore, the more I thought about it, I felt like, you know what, graphicness is really just a specific case of vividness. So if you think about the definition for graphicness, which is showing blood and gore, that's an example of a detail. That's a concrete detail that you can or can't, you can have in a TV show or you cannot have. And the idea that violence is sometimes a close-up versus a long shot is really just an example of this proximate issue, right? So I grew convinced that when media violence scholars are talking about graphicness, it's really just a specific case of vividness. And you can take this whole definition of vividness and put it all together and then see vividness as a continuum, right? So like the most vivid violence would be one that's high in all of these, right? Multiple senses, high quality, lots of detail, close up, really emotionally evocative. That's like high vivid. And then low vivid would be absent of all those things. And then it's like this, this continuum and it varies. So I make this argument in this theory piece that vivid, you can use the word vividness to apply to violence and that graphicness is just a special case of vividness. And then what I did was I drew from the vividness effects research to try to make predictions about, okay, when people see vivid or graphic violence, what's gonna happen? It's different than when the violence is pallid. So again, it's not a comparison of violence versus no violence. It's bloody violence versus sanitized violence. So this kind of theory, it's called the theory of vivid media violence, and it's drawing very heavily from the vividness effects literature. The vividness affects persuasion literature by and large finds that vivid portrayals of lung, you know, a diseased lung or car crash actually don't work. They don't always work. They do not necessarily persuade people to not want to smoke or not want to drive. They fail a lot. But what those studies do find is those ads, here's what they do do. So this is do do. Here's what those ads do end up doing is that they end up drawing your attention. They lead to a sense of presence, like believe it or not, like I did an experiment where I had a graphic bloody version of a show and uh, sanitized and people were more into it when it was graphic and bloody. Um, vivid violence is more emotional, so you're more disgusted, you're more frustrated, you're more scared. Um, cognitive elaboration is kind of how much you're thinking about it at the time of exposure, right? You're like trying to make sense of it and you're rationalizing it, you're thinking about it. So drawing from the vividness effects literature, I say that vivid, vivid violence is going to lead to all these things, more so than seeing pallet or you know, sanitized violence. Now the vividness effects literature, the next step would be persuasion, like attitude change. I'm not going to smoke, I'm not going to text and drive. And again, that's where the, the vividness stuff falls apart. Like, Even though the vivid commercials do, make, do lead to all these, they don't make people not want to smoke. But that's not what I'm interested in, right? I'm not a persuasion scholar, I'm not right here trying to change attitudes. I'm trying to just understand what happens when people watch graphic violence. And so what the literature suggests is if all these things happen in the short term, you're paying attention, you're engaged, and you're really, you know, like strong emotions, and you're really thinking about it, that those, that there's going to be some long-term effects that are really cognitive, right? Like these images are going to be highly accessible in memory maybe for many years, and you can't forget that one really graphic bloody movie you saw when you were a kid, and you just can't get it out of your mind. And maybe your scheme, our mental models are going to be formed by this and are going to be um, graphic and bloody in detail. So I won't go too much more into this, other than to say, some of these you might be thinking, like, well, not everybody gets drawn into vivid violence, right? Some people see graphic violence and they go like this. And I'm kind of one of those people, right? So we do tend to see that bloody graphic things do kind of capture our attention. It's probably a fight or flight thing. But for some people, once it's got our attention, they're going to go like this. 
And so I do have some moderators here that say, you know, not everybody is going to be drawn into it. So like sensation seeking, for example, people high in sensation seeking will be more likely to be like really into it, and those low will be doing this. Gender should be a moderator, right? The research suggests men should be more into it, and women would be more likely to do that. Um, age suggests younger people will be more into it, older people will not. And there's probably more moderators as well, but that's kind of what I went into in the paper. Um, so one question is, well, who cares? Like, why does this matter? Um, why do things like accessibility and mental models matter? One reason is that we know that those are the building blocks for other media effects, right? So like if you're, um, the general aggression model says, if you're going to be aggressive, your mental models for aggression are one thing that kind of determine how you're going to behave in various situations. Um, cultivation relies on accessibility, right? So these kind of mechanisms here then connect to other media effects theories that talk about you know, long-term and short-term effects. Another reason why I think this matters, though, is because when you talk to parents, this issue of bloodiness and graphicness is the thing they care about the most. Mm -hmm. um, when they're policing their own, I shouldn't say policing, when they are monitoring their own children's TV viewing and movie viewing habits, the issue of how bloody or gory something is tends to be the most important thing. We've had that as kind of just anecdotal evidence, but I actually just collected data on this on Monday, and I got the data in yesterday, and I was able to throw in one slide. There was, the data were not cleaned. This is not, you know, it's, it needs some tweaking. So let me explain what this was. This was a, a survey of parents, nationwide survey of parents, and end of 600, they have kids in kindergarten through fifth grade. And I basically said to them, um, let's say a brand new TV show or movie or video game that's age appropriate. I made sure to say it's age appropriate. It's not like Pulp Fiction or something. Uh, an age appropriate movie has come out, but it's got violence in it. What factors do you use to decide whether or not you're going to let your kid watch that show? And I also said, even if you, because a lot of parents will say, my kid never watches any violence. Uh, so I said, you know, even if you are somebody who would never let your kid watch this at all, think about what you would use, right? So you're trying to decide, should my kid, age 5 to 10, watch this brand new violent TV show movie? Um, how much will I take into consideration how bloody it is or not? How much will I take into consideration whether it's animated or not, whether it's funny or not, whether it's realistic versus fantasy, whether it has an anti-violence theme versus not, whether the violence is committed by the good guys or the bad guys, or whether the violence is all throughout the show versus just in one or two spots. And so this is a one to five scale, and um, all the answers are kind of hovering in this 3.5 range, but you can see this bloody graphic is the highest, and I did some paired comparisons, and it's significantly higher than all of these. So the number one thing that they're taking into consideration is how bloody it is. Now, I have so much to do on this because I could look at this as, like based on the gender of the child, right? If you're, if you're filling out this survey for a boy, do your answers differ whether it's a girl? Um, the other thing I did was I actually, amongst the 600, they were randomly assigned into three groups. A third of them were told to think about movies, a third of them were told to think about TV, and a third were told to think about video games. So I collapsed them all together. So this is just a combination of all 600 people, but it could be that like the answers for video games are different than movies and TV. So these are some things that I still have to do. Um, but again, it's this evidence that this is what matters a lot to parents. Now I will say, despite my own professional interest in it, it is not necessarily the most important thing, right? If I were to say what's the most important, it's probably this right here. Right? Like you can have a show that's bloody or graphic, but if it has an anti-violence right. theme, if it teaches kids that violence is a bad, it should be avoided, it should be terrible, sometimes blood does that, right? Sometimes blood and gore is what helps communicate like, hey, violence isn't just like this casual thing, right? If you just punch somebody and everybody walks away like no big deal, like that's actually not how it is usually in the real world. So scholars might think that this is the important one, but parents are really, you know, focused on this. So I've grown over the past few years really curious about what parents care about um, because, well, in part, I am a parent, and I find this tension within my own household, quite honestly. I'm raising two boys who are 6 and 12. They love their violent shows. And I, my husband is someone that often says, oh, it's not bloody or graphic, so it'll be fine. They can watch this. Um, so I know that there's a tendency about, among parents to really focus on that. Um, and there's a lot of scholars who are developing interventions to try to help, if kids do see media violence, how to minimize the effects. If we want those interventions to work, though, a couple things have to take place. First, we have, as scholars, we have to develop them and test them. 
Amy Nathanson at Ohio State is one of the major people doing this. But then where scholars often fail is this, like actually like publishing it in a book that would be sold in you know, Barnes and Noble so the average parent could buy it. But even if we did get better at this, and some scholars are, there's this issue, right? Like you have to convince the parent like, there is the possibility of negative effects if your kids watch media violence, so you need to t use this strategy. And if they believe, oh, no, no, not my kid, not my kid, then they're not going to take this advice anyway. So another part of that study, that of this sample of 600 that I didn't get a chance to look at, I basically asked them to think about different media effects. So some of the research suggests media violence can make kids more angry or angry hostility. This is cultivation, seeing the world as a mean and dangerous place desensitization, getting frightened, or getting aggressive. And I basically asked for each one of these effects, I asked the parents, do you think this could happen to your child? Like, it, I give them a hypothetical situation. Your kid spends three weeks at grandma and grandpa's house, because it's not your fault, mom or dad, it's grandma and grandpa's fault. Because <laughs> people are really sensitive, right? It's not you, somebody at the babysitter. Um, they watch violent movies for three weeks. Do you think it's possible that your kids could become angry or hostile? And then if they did, is that serious? Like, do you care about it? So I did this for all of these. Do you think it's possible your kid could get desensitized? If so, is that a serious problem or not? Do you think your kid could get frightened? If so, would that be severe? And what I'm suspecting is that for some of these effects, like fear or fright, I imagine most parents will say, oh, yeah, my kids get scared all the time. But if you ask them, is that severe or serious, they're going to be like, it's no big deal. I mean, all kids, right? we probably all can remember being scared by a movie or a TV show, and we all survived to see adulthood, right? So I'm guessing that parents will think this is likely, but not severe. I'm imagining this is the opposite, right? I'm imagining most parents are going to say, not my, my kid is not going to be aggressive, my kid will not be a bully. But if they were, that would be a big problem, but not my kid. And so maybe like there's some of these other outcomes where we can find a balance, where like, your parent might say, yeah, I can see this happening to my kid, and if it did, it would be a big problem. Um, and so they might be motivated. If we were to develop interventions, they might actually be motivated to like interact it or enact it if they believe that this is something they should care about, right? So this is kind of drawing from, like, if you've done protection motivation theory and EPPM, the idea that people are motivated to act when they feel a threat. And if parents feel like a media effect is likely to happen to their kid and they think it's severe, they'll do something about it. Otherwise, they're not going to you know, do anything. All right, I think I'm at the end. So kind of in conclusion, um, graphicness or vividness, whatever you want to call it, matters, right? Like the, the theory and subsequent research suggests that it does increase the likelihood of some effects, right? Very emotional. They cause you to really think and elaborate about it. They draw our attention. And they stay with us for many years. At the same time, it's not the only thing that matters, right? It's not the only feature that matters. Whether violence is rewarded, whether it's committed by good guys, those things matter as well. And so it's not, it's not the only contextual feature. It's maybe not even the most important one. There are other things that parents should be thinking about, right? And so I've grown concerned over the past few years that there's this disconnect with parents, um, that they focus maybe too much on blood and gore at the detriment of other things, right? And so when their kids are watching things, where people are pummeling each other, but it's not bloody or gory, and especially if it's funny and animated, they think it's like, that's no big deal at all. And the only things that they're trying to look out for is blood and gore. And so I'm, 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 I'm growing interested in doing more surveys of parents to try to figure out how, what, how do we get them to consider other features? How do we get them to consider violence that's animated, the, the fact that it might be serious, right? That it could maybe lead to some negative effects. Um, and then how do we convince them to care about these different effects? So that's, I think, all I have for today. So thank you.